So welcome to NOAA Live. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. This series is sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant. That's where I work, and I'm located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and our amazing partner, NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on our webpage or simply follow us on Facebook. We're posting um, before each webinar. This is the fifth webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closures. For those of you that don't know, all of our speakers work for some part of NOAA. A lot of times folks know a NOAA, but we're spelled a little differently. We're the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, so NOAA. Today we are introducing you to Glenn Field. He is going to talk to you all about being a meteorologist and discuss extreme weather events and lightning safety. You're in for a treat. A few guidelines though before I introduce Glenn officially. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear the speaker. However, as you've seen, we really do want to hear from you. So there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to write them as we go along. I'll be jotting them down on my piece of paper and keeping track of them for Glenn. And he'll stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all of the questions, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Depending on your device, how you access the question box may be different. Looks like you've all figured it out. Um, for some of you, it might be a question mark on the bottom or the side of the screen. Others might have a little box on the side of the screen with an arrow and a hand. The arrow will allow the, you to show the question box. We will not be using the raise hand function. So, like I said, you're in for a treat. I'm going to turn it over now to Glenn so that he can tell you all about being a meteorologist. All right. <clears throat> can everybody see me? I hope. Um, good morning, yes, everyone, and happy April Fool's Day. And I hope everybody's staying safe and washing their hands uh, pretty frequently. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, really appreciate the invite. And I know we have a lot of school kids there ranging from elementary school to, I know there are some actually some high school students and even a few teachers on the line. So um, hopefully that you'll, there'll be a little bit that everyone can take from this presentation. Um, as Grace said, um, to the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, made up of the oceanic part. And so far, the webinars have been dealing with the oceanic part. Today, we're going to talk about the atmospheric part, which is the National Weather Service, pretty much. And um, so uh, what I want to show you is different types of weather, some uh, severe weather that we deal with and then get into the main part of today's presentation, which is lightning and lightning safety. And at the end, I have a video, maybe difficult to hear the, uh, the thunder in the video and stuff like that, but I'll be narrating it. Uh, and uh, once you see that video, I think you'll remember it, maybe hopefully the rest of your life. Um, all right, so, so we can get started now. And hopefully I do this right. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I've been interested in the weather ever since I was three years old. <laughs> Seriously, my, my dad was a ship's meteorologist in the Navy, and my mother was an elementary school music teacher, and they uh, got divorced when I was one year old. So I would visit my dad on the weekend, and he would teach me all about the weather. And... Also other things like geography. And here you can see I was pointing to the state capital of Indiana, Indianapolis. And um, my mother would, uh, she was elementary school music teacher. So she got me involved in singing in the choirs and acting in the plays. I was in My Fair Lady and Oliver. And so it's interesting how my career became a combination of the two of them. Um, I give 50 to 60 presentations every year to all of our customers, which are emergency managers, the media, school children, aviators, uh, fire departments, 
police departments. Everyone is our customer. Everybody is interested in the weather. So we're talking about weather, but what is weather? Um, well, that, uh, I'm not asking for you to answer right now. It's just a rhetorical question. But basically, um, you know, we, we cover everything at the National Weather Service that falls from the sky. That's precipitation. So that's rain, snow, hail, sleet. And you need to know whether to carry an umbrella or not. Things like temperature, whether it's going to be hot or cold. It's kind of cool out there today. Should I wear a short? Should I wear a sweater? Uh, the wind, is it going to be windy? You know, will I need a hat today? Or is it going to be so strong and dangerous that I got to board up my windows like from a hurricane? Um, then uh, how about the sky cover, whether there's clouds or not, and whether you need, if it's really sunny out, maybe some extra sunscreen at the beach, for example. And then, of course, what we're going to talk about today, a lot of dangerous weather like severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, blizzards, and hurricanes. Uh, there's, there's a lot of dangerous weather out there. And what's the difference between weather and climate, just so we mention that? Weather is what's going to happen in the next day or two or maybe even up to seven. But climate is over long periods of time, what the weather is over the next 10, 20, 30, or 100 years. So uh, part of our agency deals with climate. That's the uh, Climate Prediction Center. It's part of the National Weather Service. But I'm in a local office here in Norton, Massachusetts, and we just try to get day one right, <laughs> and at least the next week. It's going to rain tomorrow, by the way, tomorrow and tomorrow night. Anyway, who are, who are we? Uh, we are the National Weather Service, and we're part of U.S. Department of Commerce. Why commerce? That's because weather is important for all kinds of industries, like uh, you know, boating, transportation, uh, you know, shipping, uh, airplanes, basically everything. That's we used to be in the Department of Agriculture a long time ago, but now we're in the Department of Commerce. And within that is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we mentioned before, NOAA. And the Weather Service is part of NOAA, the atmospheric part. And uh, so we're part of the federal government. Uh, and your parents' tax dollars paid for this presentation. <laughs> so we are here in the Boston Norton office. Um, one of 122 forecast offices in the country, and I understand there's Las Vegas and Seattle on here. You can find your your forecast offices there. But the red arrow here is pointing to the Boston forecast office, and that's where we're located in Norton. And we serve uh, really the only state that we have all of is Rhode Island. Uh, we do the Northeast three counties in Connecticut that I'm pointing to here with the mouse. Uh, we do all of Massachusetts except Berkshire County. That's because they're under the jurisdiction of the Albany office. Um, and the reason for this breakdown is the Doppler weather radars that are located at each of these forecast offices out on Long Island and Albany and here in Norton, Massachusetts. And so they picked the coverage areas from the radars to, to, to explain where the forecast offices would be. So that's why there's kind of a mixed thing there. And our main mission in the National Weather Service is pretty simple and it's pretty important, saving lives and saving property. And how do we do that? Well, the day-to-day -day forecasts can make it more convenient, but actually saving lives comes when we issue severe thunderstorm and tornado warnings, for example. Uh, we can uh, set off all kinds of alarms, the TV will go off, and uh, you'll see that you're under a tornado warning. That would be the most one of the most serious types of warnings that we can have and try to protect lives. If we can save one life, that makes us so happy that we've done our job. And how do you find our information? You can see here on the bottom of the screen, weather.gov. Remember, now, weather.com, that's the Weather Channel. That's a private weather company, and everybody watches that, and they're, they're excellent. 
and getting our word out as well. But weather.gov is your government tax dollars. That's that's uh, our office. Weather.gov will give you the whole country, uh, and you can just click on your area. Uh, in our area, it's weather.gov slash Boston. Seattle will probably be weather.gov slash Seattle. Um, but you can also find us on Twitter. We're at NWS Boston on Facebook under US Weather Service Boston. And if you have a weather radio, which uh, broadcasts weather all the time, just the weather, you can pick that up at your favorite electronics outlet. Um, we broadcast on uh, many different weather radio uh, channels. And uh, that will alert you at three o'clock in the morning if we have a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning or a flash flood warning that alarm will go off and wake you up. So it's great to have a weather radio on hand. You can get them for something like $25. So let's talk about some of the active kinds of weather. Severe thunderstorms produce large hail and damaging winds. The winds have to be 58 miles an hour or greater. And so here's an example of what's called a downburst. Now downburst, every thunderstorm has what's called an updraft of winds and a downdraft of winds. But really strong downdrafts called downbursts can be extremely damaging, as you see here, destroying the car. And um, so we definitely warn for those kinds of things. Whoops. Uh, and, and large hail, which I have on another slide, but that that's uh, one inch hail in diameter. That's the size of a quarter or more would be what we call severe. So let me just stop here and, and just maybe we have time for one or two questions about severe thunderstorms, if you have any questions. I want to save time for lightning though. So we have a um, we have a couple of questions. So one question that we have is where do most storms happen? That's Je uh, Jennifer asked that. Um, okay across the whole country or here in New England? <laughs> well, most thunderstorms in the country actually occur in Florida because it's interesting, the air comes in from the East Coast and from the West Coast from a sea breeze and they collide in the middle, right around uh, the middle of the state there in Orlando, for example. And you get thunderstorms form every practically every day, especially in the summertime. And so they're, they're the most frequent thunderstorms are there. Some of the most severe thunderstorms with tornadoes occur in the midsection of the country. The Tornado Alley, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, that area, because cold air comes down from Canada and meets up with the warm air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and some other factors there as well. And um, here in New England, I can say, um, thunderstorms are more frequent out in western Massachusetts and northern Connecticut. Um, the the uh, higher terrain can be can help there. When it gets out to the eastern part of the area, you start getting sometimes under the marine influence from the uh, the ocean, which cools things down a little, and the thunderstorms weaken. Well, that was an interesting question. So let's, Thank you. Let's just move on to the the next categories because that. You know, we want to save a lot of time for the lightning here. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we're back on the slides there. Okay. So, uh, uh, tornadoes. Uh, tornadoes. Uh, are very frequent in the Midwest, as I mentioned, not so frequent here in New England, but we do get one to maybe three tornadoes every year. They tend to be the smaller variety. Uh, they rank them on a scale of EF1, that's the enhanced Fujita scale, EF1 through five. And um, generally the zeros and ones uh, is what we get, but about every 10 years we get some really big ones. You can see on the left here we have the Worcester tornado was the granddaddy of them all in 1953. 
had uh, killed uh, 94 people, 84 minutes, 94 lives. And uh, in the upper right, we have the Great Barrington tornado in Western Massachusetts killed three people. This four by four is driven right through the car. And um, we even had a tornado go through downtown Providence in 1986. And um, so big cities are not necessarily immune to getting the tornadoes. Um, we have a question about tornadoes. Let's, let's take this topic. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. So I'm going to give you sort of three and you can answer them in any order that you want. Um, one question was, what's a typical miles per hour of a tornado? So what's the speed? And um, a person from Massachusetts asked, I think this was Carl, what are the most tornadoes that have occurred in one year? I don't know if you know that number off the top of your head, but if you do, I think there was interest in knowing, you know, on average how many how many tornadoes in Massachusetts happen in one year? And and then we had another question, just how do tornadoes form? So I'll stop with those three. Wow, that's a lot of questions. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so the average speed, so if you look up the enhanced Fujita scale, um, the zeros and ones are on the weaker variety can range anywhere from 50 miles an hour up to 100. I would say 90 to 100 miles an hour. I don't have the scale right in front of me. Whereas an EF5 tornado is 200 miles an hour or more. And um, so there's a tremendous uh, difference between a 70 mile an hour gust and a 200 mile an hour gust. So an EF5 can destroy everything in its path and there is no safe place from it. And um, and he, uh, you know, the smaller ones, you're probably safe in your basement and, um, you know, do less damage, but still pretty important. Um, what was the second question? The second <laughs> so, question, oh, I think. Yeah, some how, folks... many, how many tornadoes in Massachusetts? I think that's a good question. Um, I became close to the record, if not breaking the record, a couple of years ago with, um, I think we had 11 tornadoes in our forecast area in that one season. I think it was 2018 season. And um, they were all of the zero and one variety, thank goodness. Uh, but that was a lot. And I think that may have been the record. And um, now that was in our forecast area. That includes Connecticut and Northern Rhode Island as well. Might have only been like seven in Massachusetts. Uh, three of them were on Cape Cod. Um, which was very unusual. And so how they form? Well, to make it simple, we have, uh, you have to have very strong winds aloft uh, in the atmosphere, 90, 100 mile an hour jet stream way up in the upper levels of the atmosphere uh, where the jets fly. And um, at the same time, you need to be very hot out or at least uh, very warm compared to how uh, what the temperature is above it. So let's say it's very hot at the ground and just sort of lukewarm in the middle, then that makes it unstable and allows the air to rise rapidly. It doesn't have to be a hot day. It could be a warm day with even colder air above it. That makes it unstable as well. Um, and you also need a turning of the height in, in with the winds. It gets fairly complicated. It's where you go to school to learn calculus and things like that. But let's say you have south winds at the surface, okay, a nice southerly wind. And it turns clockwise so that as you go aloft, you have west winds aloft. So if you're lucky enough to look outside, you can see the low-level clouds moving from south to north and the mid-level clouds moving from west to east. That means that you've got some turning in the atmosphere. And if you combine that with instability, which is the hot with the cooler air above it and strong winds aloft, then that's ideal for a tornado situation kind of day. And you need something to set it off, like a cold front coming through, um, things like that. All right, let, let's move on. Great questions.
Are we back on the slides there? <laughs> okay. So there's an example of some back. tornado. Pardon me? Oh, we can see your slides. I was just answering you. Sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I showed you the Worcester tornado from 1953 on the right-hand side there, but look at the one from Monson in Springfield back in 2011. Looked just the same. Uh, Monson was an EF3 tornado and Worcester was an EF4 tornado. So you think those are bad enough. Um, imagine what an EF5 could do. We have a Doppler weather radar located at our office in Norton. And um, the Doppler weather radar, what it does is it sends out a, a beam. And when it encounters a raindrop, some of the uh, reflectivity is back to the radar off of that raindrop. So if you have a lot of raindrops, you get a lot of reflectivity back. And we can color encode that yellow and red on our radar picture. Um, but what the Doppler radar does, you may have heard about the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect, let's say if a train is coming toward you, it sounds like and the train is going away from you. It's a frequency, frequency shift. And um, so our Doppler radar can detect whether or not that raindrop was not just how many raindrops there are, but whether or not it's coming toward or away from the radar. And so we can color encode that. And so on this picture, you see the reflectivity up here and the velocity, the motion of the radar of the raindrops on the bottom here. So on the top picture, you see how it's curving around and wrapping around right there. All this heavy rain is being wrapped around the tornado. That's why it's wrapping around into a little ball right here. And if you look at the bottom, picture this is blue which means the air is you see on the bottom of the scale the blue means it's rushing toward taunton with where the radar is that taunton is way off to the right here and we're looking out to the west and so blue means it's coming toward the radar and the pinks off the other end of the scale mean it's rushing away from the radar so if it's coming toward and away that's a circulation and it happens to be right in the same spot if you overlay the two, you see they're identical where the tornado is. That tells us it's a, a tornado and a very serious one. Large hail can do a lot of damage. Um, <clears throat> the uh, largest hailstone in recorded history that I'm aware of was eight inches in diameter. Uh, that can do a lot of damage. That was out in Nebraska, I believe. Um, this picture here is about four inches in diameter. See that with a, the ruler there? But we consider it to be severe enough to issue a warning if it's one inch in diameter, just the size of a quarter. But when it gets this big, it can start doing damage. Um, I think we'll move on without asking questions on this one, but I can tell you that the largest one in Massachusetts history, I believe was uh, four and a half inches in diameter. Uh, so that's pretty big. And flash floods, we get those a lot, uh, especially in our urban areas um, here in New England, but we can also get them out in the hillier terrain out in Western Massachusetts. And of course you get them a lot out in the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, the higher the terrain, the faster the rain runs off. And uh, it only takes like two feet of water to float your car away. So we have a saying, turn around, don't drown. It's the number one thunderstorm related killer. Uh, and even not even thunderstorm, just weather related killer. It could be heavy rains for a period of days that end up causing floods and flash floods. And the reason being, there can be road washouts. Here's a picture of a road and if it's covered with water and you're driving past it um, and there is no road beneath you, that's, that's big trouble. So, don't assume that the road is actually underneath you. It could be washed out. So turn around, don't drown. That's our, our famous expression there. And we have coastal floods. Coastal floods like the perfect storm in uh, 19, uh, when was that, 1991. Uh, here's the blizzard of 1978. You live along the coast and you have, uh, unbelievable wave action with 70 to 90 mile an hour winds 
and very big nor'easters uh, can cause a lot of problems. And let me just show uh, one more, uh, two more types here. Uh, winter storms, uh, heavy snow in the blizzard of 78. This caused uh, so much snow that people had a lot of time on their hands and wrote this, this street needs plowing. And um, you can see all the cars buried here. Ice storms can cause damage and the freezing rain accumulating on power lines can knock them down as well as trees. And finally, hurricanes. And I'll take questions right after this. Um, hurricanes are the things that actually keep us up the most at night as meteorologists, um, worried that someday we're gonna really suffer the impacts. Here you can see uh, from Hurricane Carol, the house over here belonged over here. 250 boats wiped out in this one marina alone. The 1938 hurricane had such strong winds that it blew this brick building apart all the way up into New Hampshire. And Hurricane Bob was the last hurricane that we've had that hit New England in 1991. So it's been 28, 29 years now uh, since we were hit by a direct hit by a hurricane. And that was a weak category two. They also range on a scale of one to five. Um, that's called the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. Anyway, uh, so the average return period for a hurricane of any kind is 13 years here in Southern New England. And it's been, like I said, 29 years, so we are due. But a category three uh, <clears throat> that can blow your entire house apart like this in 1954, <clears throat> the last major hurricane we had, was what 66 years ago and the average return period for a major hurricane here is 62 years so we're right in that time frame where we're not only due for a hurricane but a major hurricane i like to point out here what room survived the lowest floor in the interior of the building right there and um so put as many walls between you and the storm as possible we like to say all right let's take a couple of quick questions and then we want to move on to lightning because that's very important Okay, we have a, a variety of questions about um, natural disasters and, and different storms, so we'll go through a couple of those. What is the most, what is the natural disaster that happens the most frequently, Marta is asking? Most frequently. Obviously, hurricanes are not very frequent, but huge, huge impact. And the reason it keeps us up at night is that, um, we know how bad the impact can be. Let me just say uh, what we didn't mention is, imagine one out of every five trees is, would be left standing in a major hurricane. And hospitals and emergency facilities would be shut down for over a month. Um, bad time to have a heart attack, unfortunately. So people don't realize how impactful a hurricane can be, a major hurricane here. And we don't get them very often, so people build near the coast, and we're just asking for trouble. Uh, with the most frequent, that's really hard to say. I mean, winter storms occur a lot. Um, severe thunderstorms, squall lines is our most frequent thing in the summertime. So I would say winter storms and severe thunderstorms, <laughs> probably the most frequent. And people were wondering what the largest hurricane in U.S. history was. And I found, yeah. Maybe, you, did you find it? <laughs> um, well, I found that Hurricane Camille in 1969 had the highest wind speed at landfall. So uh, that had estimated 190 miles per hour winds. Camille was certainly a Category 5 hurricane. Katrina did a lot of damage, but I believe it was officially a 3. Uh, the hurricane, possibly a four just offshore. It was a five at one point. But yeah, Camille comes to mind. Andrew in Florida was another category five in 1992. Uh, probably the, the biggest ones that come to mind. And then Hugo was a category four. South Carolina, I believe that was 1989. Don't quote me on that. Um, one more question? Yeah, so um, one question 
just in keeping with the hurricane theme that we have going here, is folks are wondering, it's a, it's a two part, but I think one part is, is pretty easy, is why they're named after people. And, mm -hmm. and they're just wondering um, how a hurricane forms. So if you could just really briefly, because okay. you know, you've been talking about storms, yeah. Real quickly, um, prior, like back in the 1938, it was just known as the 1938 hurricane because um, they didn't have names for the storms. And and so what happens if you have three hurricanes in 1938? You got to call them the 1938 hurricane, the first one, and the 1938 hurricane, the second one. And so it was just for the ease of keeping track of them that they decided to name them. And um, the World Meteorological Organization is actually the one that names them and creates the lists of names. You can find them years in advance on the Hurricane Center uh, website. And they they all, uh, starting, they used to be just women's names and they alternated uh, starting with men's names and women's names now. Um, and they also have uh, a flavor of the whole world. So they're not just uh, United States names. There's uh, uh, Caribbean names and and uh, all kinds of uh, nationalities in there. And then when there's a really big one, they they retire that name and um, it'll never be used again like Hugo or Andrew. Um, and how they form is entirely different than tornadoes. We talked about what's needed for a tornado. Tornadoes are very small. They cover just, uh, I mean, the biggest one is one mile wide. Hurricanes, Hurricane Allen, I remember in 1980, took up the entire Gulf of Mexico, hundreds of miles across. So they form from warm ocean waters uh, and weak winds aloft, okay? And so if there's strong winds aloft, it's kind of the opposite of a, uh, of a tornado, strong winds aloft, it kind of shears it apart. It can't really sit there and intensify. But when it comes off the coast of Africa, it encounters very, very warm waters in the upper 80s, 90 degree water. And that's just fuel for the hurricane. It's really the warm ocean temperatures as well as weak winds aloft. Those are the main ingredients. And then they have days and days of not encountering any land and the land weakens it because it needs the warm ocean water to keep it going. All right, Let, let's move on because uh, time is getting late here and we really want to get through uh, some lightning stuff. So let's talk about it really fast here and I want to get to the video. Lightning is very dangerous. It's the number two killer nationwide uh, next to flash floods. Um, <clears throat> Here's a place that gets so much lightning that they put a lightning detector right at the pool. And there's two pool managers doing absolutely nothing to protect people. Water conducts electricity, so you don't want to be in the pool when there's lightning. Here's lightning striking the top of a, a building, and here's lightning at a football field. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So <clears throat> how hot is a lightning bolt? Lightning bolt is 50,000 degrees Celsius. That's five times hotter than the surface of the sun, which they say is 11,000. I've never measured it myself, <laughs> but that's what they say. Now, it amazes me that you can, be, uh, you can be struck by lightning and still revived by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. There's lightning striking the top of the Prudential Center, like I said, but it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's grounded down to the bottom of uh, the building safely. And you ever hear the expression, lightning never strikes twice in the same place? Well, it does. The Empire State Building in New York gets struck 30 times in a row sometimes, because once it digs its channel through the atmosphere, it's very easy to come through the very same path the next time. But it's not always the tallest object. Here's the space shuttle on the launch pad, and there's lightning striking the base of the space shuttle. And here's the tallest object in the parking lot, and lightning striking 50 feet away. There's lightning striking the top of a church steeple in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. And this is an airliner. Sometimes airliners get struck by uh, lightning and you hear a little pop, but this time 
it served as the initiator of the lightning strike. You can tell because it went both upward and downward from the plane. And it was right near the airport near Osaka, Japan, 46 people on board, and it did damage some of the uh, cockpit instrumentation, but they were able to land safely. Now, these two people were at the top of Morrow Rock at Sequoia National Park in California in 1975. And their hair stood on end because that's what happens when you're, the uh, charge in the cloud is such that your hair rises to meet that charge. So jokingly, but not so jokingly, I say, what do you, what's the first thing you should do? Take a picture, <laughs> but really not, right? You wanna run down the mountain to safety. And that's what these people did. However, one person was killed and eight people injured that replaced them on the same platform when lightning struck five minutes later, you'd think it would be instantaneous, but they had five minutes of warning. You don't want to be underneath trees because then you're the tallest, the tree is the tallest object around, especially an isolated tree, and you can get a side flash. So stay away from trees altogether. Here's lightning striking a tree, and you can see this little thing here. This is an upward streamer. The lightning goes both downward and upward. And so the big bolt occurs where the upward streamer meets the downward streamer, and then you get a real big bolt, which can be really dangerous. Do you ever hear that you should crouch down, make yourself as small a target as possible? Well, we take that back. We, we used to say that, but we took that back a long time ago. There is no safe place outside. And as the title of this presentation says, when thunder roars, go indoors. That's the only safe place is indoors. If you think about it, lightning striking from 40,000 feet in the sky, you think it matters if it's 39,999 feet because you're crouching? I don't think so. So just remember, don't remember this rule. Go indoors. That's the safest place. And you don't want to be near metal fences. This is a sad picture, but uh, the cows were killed because they were grazing along the metal fence. Lightning travels long distances. One out of every eight lightning strikes occurs outside the rain area. So everybody seeks shelter when it's pouring, but it's the bolt from the blue out here that can surprise and kill people because it's actually maybe even still partly sunny out there. And um, lightning can strike way outside a storm, the, generally up to 10 miles, but it could, the farthest documented case was 34 miles outside the storm. Here's rain occurring and lightning outside the rain area, sent in by a, a spotter in Duxbury. You see anything, um, maybe not the smartest idea here? <laughs> Here's a guy just out for a jog, and these are just a few fractions of a second apart when lightning was striking all over the place. Not a good time to be outside. And how about those baseball coaches and soccer coaches that say, okay, it's time to go out and play again because uh, the lightning, <clears throat> uh, because the rain has ended, okay? But that's not safe. We have another rule that says that you should wait a good 30 minutes until after the last lightning occurs to go back outside. Uh, after the last thunder. Uh, and um, by the way, should you go to a dugout? No, nothing open. The only safe place is indoors. Unless there are buses parked around the perimeter of the, uh, the, the field, and then you can go inside a bus because a vehicle provides protection. And here's that picture of the uh, football stadium that I showed. Michael Vick's team back in 2000. Uh, at the Virginia Tech Hokies here in Roanoke, Virginia. 50,000 people in the stadium and lightning struck six tenths of a mile behind the stadium. And the game was canceled, uh, but that was really close because uh, you can't protect everybody. You can't all fit inside the concourse and these little lightning arresters at the top of the stadium are not gonna really help you an awful lot. And um, we actually were on site at uh, the fireworks in Boston, uh, this was back in 2012, eight years ago during the July 4th celebration, and we actually were working with emergency officials and got them to evacuate everybody into the Storo Drive tunnel to 
avoid the Esplanade, and sure enough, lightning struck uh, two miles away in East Boston. That could have been very dangerous with over 500,000 people uh, gathered for the Boston Pops fireworks concert. And after it passed, everyone went back out and enjoyed the show, and everyone was safe, thank goodness. Um, but that's some support that we give. All right. Um, let's see. <laughs> Let me move on to the video here, and then I guess we can take a few questions at the end. Okay, this is, uh, I have to tell you the story. Um, now, actually, where I'm from, there, our high school uh, was very similar. We had a uh, marching band practice going on when lightning was striking one day. And I went out there and warned them that it wasn't safe. And thank goodness everybody moved indoors, but that was a little too close for comfort. This video is about a minute and a half long, and it may be really difficult to hear. I turned up my volume, but it may not go through great. But I will narrate it as we go along. This occurred in Florida. It's during a halftime show at a football game. And what you're going to see, is, and I want you to pay attention, there are many clues. Now, remember, a regular thunderstorm, but I didn't mention is a severe thunderstorm warning that we issue is only for large hail and damaging winds, but we won't issue a warning for a regular thunderstorm. And why is that? Because every thunderstorm produces lightning. That's what causes the thunder when it heats it up to 50,000 degrees, then there's a big boom called thunder. So every thunderstorm has lightning. So you're not gonna necessarily have your radio go off or your cell phone for a, for a regular thunderstorm. So you have to, Remember certain rules. When thunder roars, go indoors. If you can hear it, fear it. And if you can see it, flee it. <laughs> All those rules. So if you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck. So <clears throat> I'll start the video and let's see. Hopefully this works. So pay close attention to all the clues that you would have had if you were there at this game. Let's see. There we go. Now you're probably not hearing it. There was a flash of lightning. Did you see it? Pay close attention. That was your first clue. I don't know if you can hear them playing, but it's a very nice song. Oh, there was a slight roar of thunder just there too, in the background. Two clues, lightning and thunder. Now, I want you to also pay attention. There was another roar of thunder in the background just now, a crackle. That's the third clue. Now, look underneath this big metal pole and all the big trees behind it. That's where the opposing football team is situated, right there. See that? Is anybody going indoors? There were three clues already. Keep paying attention. Watch the sky. A big flash of cloud to ground lightning this time. Now the band stopped, so they're probably going to move indoors, right? Nope, they're just starting the next song. Oh boy. Now, for some strange reason, these players decide to move away from that tree, and it's a good thing because watch, the tree got struck by lightning. Everybody's screaming. The tree was actually on fire. Now the football team comes running off the field a little bit too late because he had six clues before that. And still, the marching band is still going. That's hard to believe. So that's what I wanted to show you. That was so close because look at what happened. There was a cloud to, ground, cloud, to, cloud to ground lightning strike with thunder and then more thunder. And then there was another cloud to ground lightning strike with more thunder. And then the tree was struck by lightning. Had those 
uh, football players, maybe 20 people, not moved away from that tree for some unknown reason? I don't know. I wonder if they felt some sort of a buzzing and decided to move away from it, but we'll never know. But they, uh, they had they not moved away, there would have been many dead or injured uh, players. And the tree was still on fire after the strike, as you can see right there. But what did the newspaper say? The newspaper said it was uh, hit with no warning. Well, not exactly true. Mother Nature gave you six warnings. Thunder, lightning, thunder, thunder, lightning. With e the very first one, if you can hear it, fear it. If you can see it, play it. And when thunder roars, go indoors. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to leave you with. But um, let's, um, I don't know, Grace, if we have any time for questions, it's 1145 right now. It is 1145, but for those that are um, going to stay on, we have quite a few questions about lightning. So as long as you're willing, Glenn, I would love to ask you a few of those questions. Um, so I'm sure you can. Uh, you told you actually answered quite a few of the questions that folks were asking. So I won't I won't uh, re-ask those. But one question that Brenner asked was, how fast can lightning travel? And maybe you said that, but if you could say it again. No, I didn't mention it. It's actually a great question because that's something I, I wanted to and forgot and didn't have time to bring up. But thank you for asking that. Um, so lightning travels at the speed of light, which is very, 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 very fast. It's just about instantaneous. So that's why we have a rule about counting. I don't know if you heard about that before, but the thunder travels at the speed of sound which is much, much slower. The speed of sound is 1,100 feet per second, roughly. And so how many feet are in a mile? 5,280. So if the speed of sound is 1,100 feet per second, it travels about a mile every five seconds. So when I mean, you see the flash, it's instantaneous. And then you count to five. If you hear the thunder at five, that means it was a mile away. If you hear the thunder at 10 seconds, it was two miles away. If you hear it at 15 seconds, it was three miles away. And so counting is an interesting thing. You can see whether it's going away or coming toward you generally. But then even after it sounds like it's away, there can be another flash right in front of you. So it's not a great rule. That's why we say wait 30 minutes until the last strike. Thank you. So I have a, a, a couple of folks are sort of asking similar things. I'm going to lump it together. So Jennifer is asking why lightning happens. And um, Emily and Madison were asking how is lightning made. And David was asking, does lightning um, get generated just from thunderstorms? So I think that they're all just sort of wondering, you know, why does lightning? How does lightning happen? Yeah, it's a complicated question. Um, lightning is from thunderstorms because by definition, that's what causes the thunder. The lightning is what causes the thunder. So thunderstorms are where lightning occurs. Um, but uh, it has a lot to do with the charges in the cloud. And um, that all happens with different ice particles uh, within big thunderstorm clouds have a lot of ice in them. And so uh, when they collide, the electrons from one get transferred to the other. And this one loses an electron, this one gains an electron. And parts of the cloud become positively charged and parts of the cloud become negatively charged. It, it's kind of complicated and I'm not the expert on that, but um, then it induces the opposite charge at the ground. And that's what causes the bolt. Thank you. Um, another question that we had, um, well, I, I'm going to lump two again. So a couple of people, William is the most recent, asked, why is the lightning so hot? And I don't know if you mentioned it, but Jennifer then asked about heat lightning, because I think there are some folks that assume that heat lightning is different from, from regular lightning and perhaps not as hot. So if you could just address why is lightning hot and um, what is heat lightning? Why it's hot? That's a, that's a good question. 
Um, I mean, electrical currents are hot. Um, and that's a heck of an electrical current. That's, that's pretty much all I can say about that. Um, they're, they're very hot. 50,000 degrees is what they say. Um, but, um, and what is heat lightning? It was a, so there's a term heat lightning out there. I don't know if anybody's, you know, if you've heard that a lot, I, I heard a lot about it when I was growing up. That's where if you don't have trees in the way and you can see for miles, especially out in the Midwest, you can see uh, lightning in the distance kind of, you know, flashing, but you don't hear any thunder. And people say, that's heat lightning. Um, that's what they refer to it. It's lightning where you don't hear any thunder. So is it really a thunderstorm? Yes, it's a thunderstorm, but it's, it's just too far away to actually hear the thunder. Uh, buildings, trees, friction at the surface can slow down or can, can absorb the sound somewhat. And so uh, after, you know, if it's more than 10, 20 miles away, you may not hear the thunder but it's definitely there. So it's true that if you just have heat lightning, you do have a little bit more time. If you're not hearing the thunder, you have a little bit more time to seek shelter, but still there's that other rule. If you can see it, flee it. So, but if it's out in the distance and you're not hearing any thunder at all, then you do have a little bit more time. Great. And then just to, um, there were a lot of questions about um lightning and its effect like some um someone asked if lightning strikes the ocean does it kill the fish that comes from brenner um other folks were wondering if it hits your house can it make it explode um a, a, a variety of folks asked if you get struck by lightning like has anyone survived being struck so just just what happens okay. when it strikes. Let me try to try to address some of those um lightning does strike water um, water conducts electricity. There have been studies that um, try to show the, uh, how far down into the water it actually goes. And um, lightning likes to strike the outsides of surfaces. And so my understanding is when it hits the water, it's pretty much at the surface of the water. And so the fish way down in the water are probably okay. Um, the same thing is true uh, with your car. Remember I said that being in a car is a, uh, uh, a safe thing. Uh, that's not the rubber tires of your car that protect you. That's, that's a falsehood, a myth. Um, what it is, is the metal hard top of the car because lightning strikes the outsides of the surfaces and then it goes along the outside of the car and down to the ground. If you've ever been at the Museum of Science in Boston, they have a little cage there where the guy sits inside there and lightning strikes. Uh, as long as he's not touching the metal, he's perfectly safe it goes along the outside of the cage. And so that's why if you're in your automobile and the windows are shut and you're not touching metal, then you're safe because it goes along the outside. It's called a Faraday cage. Um, what are the other questions I forgot? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think just just some um, folks were just, you know, like Emily was asking, can lightning get in your chimney? Can it get into your house? Right, right. If it strikes the house, lightning can blow chimneys apart. They can cause fires. There was actually a strike in Massachusetts that caused a fire just a couple nights ago. It can go through the electrical systems of the house. Um, I wouldn't say it blows your house apart. It can cause a fire, which might cause damage to the house. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you don't want to be uh, touching metal. You don't want to be on the telephone when lightning is striking because it can go through the wires as opposed to corded telephone. Your, your cell phones are generally okay. And even like a, uh, a portable phone, is okay as long as it's as long as you're far enough away from the base station that is plugged into the wall, and um, uh, <laughs> what else was there? No, um, I think I think you've answered it. That's really great. 
Also wanted to mention uh, pools. Again, if you're in a pool, get out of the pool. But indoor pools, what about indoor pools? They're just as dangerous as outdoor pools uh, because um, it can go through the plumbing underneath the building. And I've given talks at, at uh, camps, for example, campgrounds. My son was at a camp up in Southern New Hampshire and they do a great job. They have a weather radio at the office and they can hear thunder. They get everybody off the lake in time, but where do people go? They go back to their bunks and congregate outside the bunk or into the bunk and take a shower. Now, you, know, you don't want to be outside and you don't want to be taking showers or doing anything associated with water and metal pipes. Anyway. Thank you. I think you've, uh, I know there are a lot more questions, but I think our, our time is sort of up. I know folks were asking about all different types of lightning. And, and one question I do want to ask you just before we conclude, there was a request, is it possible for folks to see that video that you were showing? Is that posted anywhere? Do you know? Um, what, what I will do is I will talk to Glenn about that. And if it is, we will post that as a resource if you go to the webinar page. Um, if it is not, I'll see if I can find another video that maybe has some warning signs that you can take a look at. And we'll put that with the resources that are um, listed on the NOAA Live website under Glenn's talk. And thank you so much, Glenn, so much really interesting information. And just based on the questions, people have a lot of questions, very interested in what you were saying. Um, so thank you for that. And I just also want to give a shout out that we have our next webinar on Friday at 11. Genevieve Davis from the Northeast Fishery Science Center will be talking about marine mammals and sound. So I encourage you to, um, to listen in. Glenn's webinar has been recorded. It will be posted. It usually takes us about a day to get it up, but it will be posted on the YouTube channel. Again, you can link to that from our NOAA Live website. So if you missed it or you want to tell your friends to check it out, um, please feel free to go and watch the webinar recorded on our YouTube channel. So and if you have any more questions too, I have my email address up there. I'd be happy to answer you. It's Glenn with two N's dot field, F-I-E-L-D at NOAA, N-O-A-A dot gov. Yes. And we, um, I will put that on the website as well. Thank you so much, Glenn. And we will see you all at our next webinar. Thanks.